Hello, Sean here, Mountains Garage, in the beautiful state of Maine. It's a balmy, for January, in Maine, Friday afternoon. It's actually above freezing. I have to go outside and put tire chains on my tractor because there's a snowstorm coming on Monday, and it's been around zero all week, so I haven't felt like doing it outside. But today, instead of sitting here talking to the camera, I should be outside, but we'll get to that eventually. I was excited. Yesterday, I knew my new Alpha TIG 203XI was going to show up. Of course, it didn't get here until dark. I just got done welding a drive shaft with the Lincoln Precision TIG 275, which is a fantastic welder in all aspects. The more I learn about it, it's far beyond my capabilities. I'm not the world's greatest TIG welder, but I want to be at least decent. I've had the, this welder for a long time. My skill set hasn't improved a whole lot, some, but not to the point where I consider myself even good. I've always wanted to try and invert a machine, so I bought one. Long story short. Showed up yesterday, I got it set up. My setup's a little different because I'd already had a body dual regulator because I wanted to make a back purge uh, situation for stainless exhaust pipe. So I already had a dual regulator, and that's how I hooked both welders up to the same bottle for now. And when I do purging, I can just disconnect one welder, and I have a long hose that'll reach over here at the bench. So that's my plan. I haven't done any purging yet. We'll get to it. So I took it all apart, out of the box, assembled with a hodgepodge of stuff that I have, and watch the video, and I'll catch you at the end. I had just finished welding up this drive shaft with my Lincoln Precision TIG 275, the TIG welder I've had for, what, 15 or more years. Goodbye, pretty welds. When the UPS truck showed up, finally bring in my new welder. I've been patient. I was gonna weld up the intake elbow with my old welder, but I'm pretty sure that would have turned out. Probably no fault of the welder. So like I said, this is an experiment to see if the change of frequency that this welder will allow, the old transforming machine is 60 hertz and you can't change it. They claim that when you change that, maybe go to 120, it's a good overall easy to use setting. You can go all the way to 240, 240, I guess, about 250. That's probably off the other end of the scale for my skill level, but I'm anxious to see what the auto set. Oh, rapid set, I guess they call it. Anyway, let's get her set up and see what happens. It's the next day, as evidenced by the daylight coming through the window. I used this dual regulator I had purchased six or eight months ago because I was going to build, and still am, a purge setup for welding stainless. So I wanted a dual regulator. So I already had this. The machine came with a single regulator, which I'm sure is fine, and a short hose. But in this case, I just connected it sitting on top of my Lincoln 275 TIG. So I just ran one back to the Lincoln and another hose over to the Alpha. And I actually opened that last night and closed the hand valve. And I've only lost about half what was there. I believe it was on a thousand last night. Not bad. It never held overnight before. Simple connections on the front. The torch is negative. It has a small gas line that just got a push connect over here. That's for the foot pedal or the finger trigger. It came with both. And this is your ground, positive. I know it sounds funny, but that's the way it works in a TIG welder. This is my Lincoln foot pedal that I'm used to. One of the reasons I chose the Alpha is because it already came with the good foot pedal or the style I'm used to. There's another cheaper style that some of the low price welders come with and you'd probably end up buying a foot pedal that you enjoy using. The torch that came with the Alpha TIG can either have a 17 style torch tip, which I don't have anything 17, I don't have any cups to fit it. Totally foreign to me, I'm used to having the 20, which is a water-cooled version of the nine, I believe. 
I wrote 20 on the bag because all my other stuff is 20. So now all the hardware that I have to fit my water-cooled torch will fit this torch as well. And it's of a similar size. It's a little bit different, but it is multi-positional, which I'm not used to. So this will take a little getting used to, but everything else is normal to me. I almost forgot I bought a zippered shield for the hose. Again, kind of similar to what I'm used to. Prevent you from scarring or burning the hose, potentially. It is nice and flexible. And smaller than I'm used to. I'm used to having all the water hoses dragging those around, so that's kind of neat. We'll see how it works out here in a minute. I did not expect the hose covering to look like a pair of jeans. It's just a random one I bought off eBay, but the zipper and everything worked fantastic. It comes up a little bit short over here, but that's okay. I've read that in time, this Superflex hose might want to kink itself, so some people put some rubber over it to, as a strain relief, I guess. I could probably improve that by going on top of it. We'll see. So the torch length, from where I have it located, because I'm used to just grabbing the leads off the Lincoln and pulling them over here, and they just reach my favorite welding spot. So the torch is adequate. The foot pedal cable is fine, plenty of length. But typically what happens, they always short you on the ground side. It reaches, but you have to uh, high center yourself to go over it if I want to go that direction. Or what's that game called when you go underneath? How low can you go? It'll come to me in a minute. Limbo. That's what it's called. I will say the ground cable as well as the stick welding stinger, you know, when you, when you grab a, some cable, you can kind of get a feel for its flexibility and the quality. I'm not I'm sure it's imported. Of course it is, but really nice quality feeling anyway. And while I guess this is a complete unboxing video, <laughs> this is a 110 to 220 adapter. Or is it 115 to 230? You know. And the finger trigger, which I could run up through the hose covering if I was going to use this on a full-time basis or more often than I probably will. I can see if you were, had to crawl into a spot to weld, like on a roll cage, the finger trigger could come in handy. It's only on and off, and you can set the machine to ramp up and taper down uh, depending on how you choose to set up the machine on the board. I have to excuse the fan noise, but it's really not that bad. It's about half what I'm used to, but it's not on demand. It's on all the time. So I goofed around both on AC and DC. I uh, Using just the rapid set, which you can select this menu with these arrows. And using these arrows, you can select over here. And you can always alter there suggestions uh, but yeah how high frequency 2t 330 second tungsten eighth inch that's just a mild steel i just did it was suggested to me to try these new laser tungstens but i only bought 1 16th and 330 seconds and using the rapid set menu they won't let you go over 180 amps on a 330 second so if I'm going to weld my 3 8 elbow, I need 1 8 tungsten. No big deal. I just practiced a little bit, and it was obliterating the end after a few beads. Uh, these are the first two I did. Starts off a little dirty, then it's not bad. But again, at the end, the tungsten wasn't very good. I wasn't trying to get a good finish. I just wanted to see what it looked like. And this one, I tried a blue tungsten. 330 seconds. Definitely not as nice as that. And this needs a lot of work, but it's a place to start. So I will get some 1 8 tungsten so I can try it on high amperage. Then I tried some mild steel. This is still hot using their recommended setting for eighth inch, which was 120 amps. No big surprise. It still seems a little hot, but it welds it's a completely different experience than the transforming machine I'm used to, and I think I like it a lot. It's just 
it's hard to describe. It's just milder. It's not as much buzzing and extra noises, I guess. It's hard to describe. It just pops on and starts welding. This is 120 amps welding two pieces together, and that's more like it. That's more the color and finish I'd be looking for. And just because I can't leave well enough alone, uh, I dug out the Lincoln again, and I was able to at least start a bead on the old snorkel here, but the Alpha Tig doesn't quite get hot enough. I had to hold this a long time just to get a puddle for it, you know, concentrating the heat in here and letting it bounce up onto here because this will heat up a lot faster, but it's going to be weldable, that's for sure. I just need to get the right setup. I messed around with the Alpha Tig with every color tungsten that I had, and I really got nowhere, so we will uh, buy more stuff and regroup. Here's my finished drive shaft from yesterday. This went pretty well. I believe the Alpha Tag is going to force me to be a better welder because it has so many settings, I can try different things. That's new to me. With the Lincoln, I don't have a whole lot of options. I can choose how much cleaning effect I get and the amperage. With the Alpha Tig, if I get completely lost, which I've already tried a bunch of stuff, and I can go back to the Rapid Set menu, and at least it'll weld again. So that's kind of cool. I think I'm going to like it for steel too, but I'll keep playing with it. Uh, sidebar on the drive shaft, if you haven't watched in the past, I just buy all spice of pots and some Caffle assembly and some tiny TIG welds, and I've yet, knock on something, to have any problem. I went 180 with mine a whole bunch of times. No problem at all. So the balanced drive shafts that you buy at your local drive shaft shops, if you look at them, they're mild steel, so they're heavy to start with, and they're usually MIG welded, big MIG welds. So some are machined, some are not. I'm not I'm not anti-balancing, I just don't have any way to balance it. And with all the chrome molly stuff. Assembled as perfect as I can do it here on my bench, in my shop. So far, so good. And it's an inexpensive way to build a drive shaft, if you're curious. You can buy all the pots any way you want. All your big, you know, Jag Summit, they all have it. Drive line places. It's not that expensive to buy a length of tube and a couple of weld yokes. And then some U-joints and a yoke. This guy is putting a hot rod together. He just gave me the center the center of the U-joint distance, and I built them a shaft. Well, I guess those chains aren't going to install themselves. I only chain up the front axle. I do the rear, but the tires are too close to the fenders. It's four-wheel drive. I do the front axle, and I'm really careful not to spin or try to break anything because that front axle is set back. Out front, I have a 9.6 Fisher stainless V. A lot of stress in that front axle. If you weren't careful, you could break it. I used to work with a lot of guys that would have broken it by now. <laughs> Me, I'm pretty careful. There's enough ice underfoot now. I'd prefer not to chain it up. In a lot of years, I didn't. However, if you get a really wet, heavy snow and there's all this ice already underneath, I have to go up two hills to get to the main road. I have struggled in the past to the point of having to dig myself up with a backhoe. So I'd like to avoid that. So I'll spend a little time outside putting the chains on. That's it for today's episode. Catch you in a couple days. Like, share, subscribe. If you would, please. Thanks.